One, two, three, four, five. Now say the scripture. The scripture for today. For today is from, is from Mark. Mark. Eight. Eight. Thirty-one. Forty-one. To forty-eight. Then he began to teach them the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was in the first church that I served, I would go to Van Wert to get a haircut. And I found out early on when they found out that I was a minister it would change the conversation. I found out that the barber would warn people when they came in that there was a clergy in the chair. So I quit telling people at barber shops that I was a minister because I found out you discover a lot about life as it really is in a barber shop if they don't know that a minister is present. The one time in the barber shop, the barber said, do you know what I like about United Methodist? And I said, what would that be? And he said, they, they force you to think. And I said, oh, that's great. And he said, you know the thing I don't like about United Methodists? And I said, what? And he said, they force you to think. He said, sometimes I think it would be better if they just said, this is how it is and, and go on from there. Well, I'll tell you a lot of these stories that happen on Sunday morning. The Bible stories, if we are open to it, enable us to think, to really um, struggle with what's being said. I read recently where more guns are being sold today than uh, ever. And I wondered what kind of a discussion one might have on thou shalt not kill. Or love your enemies. Do good to those who do evil to you. I um I'd like to call your attention to today's scripture. Those who find their life will lose it. 
And those who lose their life will find it. Now, I was always taught that you be careful you don't lose anything. I, I noticed a couple pair of trousers that Wendy or somebody recently bought me have Velcro on the hip pockets. I think it's great to keep things in the hip pockets, but sometimes it's a frustration to get that Velcro apart to get out of what I need in the hip pocket. I, uh, I haven't ever intentionally tried to lose anything. I mean, no one ever said to me, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to lose my watch or I'm trying to lose this $10 bill. I just never did it. And yet this lesson says, if you lose your life, you will find it. And if you try to find your life, to keep it to yourself, you will lose it. Or take that story about the man who looked out his bedroom window and saw that his barns were filled. And he said, I know what I'll do. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And I will be content for the rest of my life. And it was then a voice said to him, tonight your soul will be required of you. In other words, to say that the best planning Sometimes it's not taken into account that we're not always going to live on this earth. In fact, that we can die most any time. Bible stories have the ability to cause us to think if we open our mind to it. Think of Adam and Eve in the garden. They were told that everything would be okay, just don't eat from this one tree. And of course, they ate from the tree and they were put out of the garden. One might have a discussion on why God put that tree in the garden. What would have happened if that tree was not there, and they were given complete freedom. And there's heaven and hell. If, if God is a loving God, why would anyone be sent to hell? Or think of the discussion of the prodigal son, who said to his father, give me my inheritance. I want to go live. I'm tired being here. And often fathers would say, well, I'm not, I'm not giving you your share of the inheritance until I die. Then you get it. But instead, the father went to the safe, got the son's share of the inheritance, gave it to him, and the son left the table. And when he had spent it all, he thought the hired servants have a better place. Why don't I go home and say I'll be a hired servant? But his father, instead of saying, well, you shouldn't have done it, or I thought this is what would happen, he went out and wrapped his arms around him and welcomed him home. Christ died and rose again. He left 
pretty quickly. There's a lot of controversy on whether he really rose from the dead. And while you're thinking about it, while you're, you're struggling to understand the scriptures, sometimes asking questions like that, why didn't Jesus stick around a little longer, like maybe a year, so that people really understood that he was living? But he was here such a short time. And then again, he, he disappeared to another place. And people were critical of Thomas because Thomas was not able to embrace the fact that Jesus had risen from the dead. You can understand that, can you? We should take it easy on Thomas. You know, um, Santa Bob was well loved by our congregation. And I remember going to the funeral home and seeing him in a casket and the service was held and he was buried. Well, someone would have walked into Gates Forth Church and said, hey, I just saw Santa Bob down at the restaurant. I'm sure that we rightfully so would have been critical. And it wasn't much different with Thomas. Thomas said, you've got to provide some proof. I've got to put my hand in his side and, and the nail prints in his fingers. And there was Judas talking about having a discussion, talking about forcing us to think if Jesus chose the disciples and he knew a lot about human nature, why did he choose Judas? And why did Judas do what he did? The Bible, as I mentioned, says, do not kill, love your enemies. Why those two things alone would take up a whole hour of Sunday school if we really talked about what they meant in this day. So what does it mean to lose your life and in the process gain it? One year when I went to Haiti, early on, I remember going into, well, walking a long distance from the city after riding in a vehicle. And then we walked through uh, much uh, land and finally came to this building that looked like it didn't belong there. It was a magnificent building. And someone says it's a hospital. It's the Albert Schweitzer Hospital. Larry Mellon of the Mellon family in Pennsylvania had uh, most anything he would want. He was not a poor person. He was potentially a very rich person. But when he had just graduated from high school, he took a trip to Africa. And there in Africa, he went to the Albert Schweitzer Hospital. And he was moved by what he saw 
the thousands of Africans that lived around that hospital who had no medical care could come for only a, a few pennies and receive some of the best medical care that was available. And in that trip, Larry Mellon said, I want to do that. He came back to the States and he registered for medical school. And he went through medical school and became a doctor. And he was the one who was behind that magnificent hospital in the midst of a wilderness in Haiti, surrounded by thousands of people who otherwise would have no medical care. When we went there, we asked if we would, could talk with Larry Mellon and he and his wife joined us in a room at the hospital. And he talked about the meaning that it had brought to his life to not only go through medical school, but to bring in the healing arts to these thousands of people in that area. He, uh, he would not say he lost his life to gain it, but the way we talk, we would say that he lost his life in the healing of people. And he indicated to us that in the midst of that, life had been more meaningful to him than uh, in anything he'd ever done. Sometimes when I am among you here at Gatesforth Church, it sometimes passes through my mind of losing your life and you will gain it. For in my visits to people's homes, they've told me of the people of the church who have helped them with tasks so they could not possibly do themselves. In our trustees meetings, when something needs to be done, invariably there are persons who say, I can do that, I, I, I will do that. Just yesterday morning, there's a large group that came to the church for the monthly breakfast. We can no longer have it in the church, but the food was handed out in large amounts as the people came to the front door of the church. Given out by people who were not paid, who find meaning in giving out food to those who lack food to feed their families. You talk about causing us to think. When we hear Jesus' words, those who lose their life will find it. And those who refuse to lose their life who tried to preserve it, who tear down their barns to build bigger barns, when that becomes the essence of life, then for us life is lost. I'm glad you've been a part of Gatesforth Church and that you're so willing to make life better for others. You get it. 
because you've been willing on many occasions to lose your life. And when I've asked people, well, why do you do that? They said, oh, it's just, it's a meaningful thing for me to do. I wouldn't trade it. I remember the story of the person who was working in a hospital and cleaning up some horrible messes in the hospital and somebody traveling through there said, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And the hospital worker said, neither would I. I do it because it brings great meaning to my life. I want to say thanks to all of you who have found meaning in life by serving others. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget Jesus' words that those who lose their life in helping others will in the end gain their life. Will you remember that? Oh God, thank you for your presence with us. And thank you for teaching us from the Bible stories, what makes life better, whole, meaningful. Thank you for teaching us that which will last forever. Amen.